Amendment 10. Rights reserved to states or people. Passed by Congress September 25th, 1789. Ratified December 15th, 1791. The first ten amendments form the Bill of Rights. The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. Common Interpretation The Tenth Amendment by Gary Lawson and Robert uh, Scampero The original Constitution of 1788 contained very few specific restrictions on the ways in which the power of the national government could be exercised against the people. It guaranteed the right to trial by jury in criminal but not the civil cases, placed limits on persecutions and punishments for treason, forbade bills of a tender laws aimed at particular persons and ex post fact ex post facto laws laws that punished conduct that was legal when it happened limited any restrictions on habeal corps to contain designated emergencies and prohibited the granting of full titles of nobility. But the Constitution that emerged from the 1787 Constitutional Convention contained nothing like a comprehensive Bill of Rights. Most state constitutions at the time had a Bill of Rights, and many citizens and members of the Constitutional Convention, Convention expected the new National Constitution to have one as well. Nonetheless, the state delegations and the Constitutional Convention would the 10 versus 0 against including a Bill of Rights in the Constitution. The sense of the Convention delegates was that the Bill of Rights in the context of the Federal Constitution was unnecessary and even dangerous. It was considered unnecessary because the national government was a limited government that it could only exercise those powers granted to it by the Constitution. And it hadn't been granted no power to violate the most cherished rights of the people. There was, for example, no need for the provision protecting freedom of speech against Congress because, as James Wilson put it, there is a given to the general government, no power whatsoever concerning it. And Mount Randolph made the same point regarding freedom of religion, emphasizing that no part of the Constitution, even if strictly constrained, will justify a conclusion that the general government can take away or impair the freedom of religion. Similar remarks were made during the drafting and ratifying ratification process regarding juries in civil cases, general warrants, and cruel and unusual punishment. The consistent line of its constitution defenders was, constitu uh, was that no Bill of Rights was necessary because the limited and uh, enumerated powers of the national government simply did not include the power to violate those rights. They even maintained that inclusion of Bill of Rights would be dangerous because it might suggest that the national government has powers that it has not actually been be granted. As Alexander Hamilton put it, Bill of Rights would contain various exceptions to powers not granted on this word account would afford a colorful, colorable protest to claim more than were granted. For why declare that things shall not be done, which there is no power to do? 
Moreover, any list of rights would be incomplete. Such a list、um, might indirectly endanger any rights not included on it. In sum, the Constitution's framers thought that a bill of rights was、uh, appropriate for a limited, unlimited government, but not for a limited one like the national government created by the Constitution. The Constitution, accordingly, sought to secure liberty through enumerations of power to the government rather than through enumerations of rights to the people. Not everyone was convinced by these arguments. Indeed, the absence of bill rights threatened to derail ratification of the Constitution, especially in key states such as Massachusetts and Virginia. A number of states ratified the Constitution only on the express understanding that the document would quickly be amended to include the Bill of Rights. The first Congress accordingly proposed twelve amendments, the last ten of which were ratified in 1791 and now stand at the Bill of Rights. The first eight of those ratified amendments identify various rights of the people, involving such things as speech, religion, arms, searches and seizures, jury trials, and due process of law. The last two addresses the concerns of constitution defenders that these enumerations of rights were pointless and even dangerous. The Ninth Amendment warns against drawing any inferences about the scope of the people's rights from the partial listing of the, some of them. The Tenth Amendment warns against using a list of rights to infer powers in the national government that were not granted. In referring respectively to rights retained by the people and powers reserved to the people, the Ninth and Tenth Amendment also invoke them. Invoke themes of popular sovereignty, highlighting the fundamental role of the people in the constitutional republic. The Tenth Amendment's simple language: "The powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people." Emphasizes that the inclusion of bill rights does not in- change. The fundamental character of the national government. It remains a government of limited and enumerated powers, so that the first question involving exercise of federal power is not whether it violates someone's rights, but whether it exceeds the national government's enumerated powers. In this sense, the Tenth Amendment is about treason. United States was Darby, nineteen forty-one. No law that would have been constitutional before the Tenth Amendment was ratified becomes unconstitutional simply because the Tenth Amendment exists. The only question posed by the Tenth Amendment is whether a claim federal power was actually delegated to the national government by the Constitution, and then the question is answered by studying the enumerated powers, not by studying the Tenth Amendment. That was the understanding. Of the Supreme Court for nearly two centuries. Nonetheless, beginning in 1976, a line of cases had emerged that it seemed to give substantive constitutional content to the Tenth Amendment. In 1986, in Garcia was the San Antonio Metropolitan Transit Authority. A narrow majority of the Supreme Court held that a city was required to comply with the federal labor laws, and that the state sovereignty interests should be protected by the participation of states in the national political process, rather than by judicially enforced principles for federalism. However, while Garcia, Garcia had never been explicitly overruled. In subsequent cases, the court has indeed found judicially enforced, enforceable limits on the powers of federal government to regulate states and their political subdivisions directly. 
So it is now meaningful to speak with Tenth Amendment doctrine in those cases or involve action by the federal government that in some way regulates a command state government, such as by telling states what policies it must adopt. New York v. United States, 1992, forcing state and local executive officials to implement the federal laws. Prince was United States, 1997 or conditional state's acceptance of federal money on compliance with certain conditions. South Dakota was stalled, 1987. Interestingly, the Tenth Amendment has not been invoked by the court to protect individual citizens against the exercise of federal power. Whether the Tenth Amendment actually is or ought to be serving as an independent source of constitutional principle of federalism is a matter of great controversy goes on and off the court. Does this Tenth Amendment cases really involve the Tenth Amendment, or do they simply interpret or members misinterpret specific grants of, of federal power in light of a certain principle codified in the Tenth Amendment, but present in the constitutional structure and design even before the Bill of Rights was ratified? Matters debate the first perspective. The Tenth Amendment, a treason with the teeth by Gary Lawson. The Tenth Amendment formally changed nothing in the Constitution. At the point statement, as the joint statement indicates, no law that would have been constitutional before ratification of the Tenth Amendment is unconstitutional afterwards. The Tenth Amendment simply makes clear that institutions of the federal government exercise only limited and enumerated powers. And then the principle infused the entire idea and the structure of the Constitution from 1988 onwards. Nonetheless, there is a significant constitutional value in the Tenth Amendment and perhaps even the value to justify the seemingly odd line of cases that use the provision directly to invalidated the con congressional laws and thereby create Tenth Amendment doctrine. As a matter of the constitutional original meaning, the entire Bill of Rights of, 19, uh, of 1791 was a principally declaratory of facts about national power that were true even without the Bill of Rights. The enumerated powers of the, rational, the national government as a constitutional defender Defenders cons consistently maintained simply did not give the national government much power to violate the rights articulated in the first eight amendments and referenced by the ninth amendment. The constitution's enumerated powers include no insurance for general warrants of clause, congressional regulation of religious clause, abolition of uh, Civil Juries Clause, and Limitation on the Right to Keep the Bare Arms Clause, and so forth. The Constitution does contain one clause that it requires, that it quite specifically like allows Congress to limit freedom of speech. The Copyright Clause of Article 1, Section 8, Clause 9, which authorized Congress to secure to others exclusive exclusive right to their writings and thereby limits the freedom of speech of persons who want to reproduce or use someone else's writings. As a number of prominent Federalists pointed out during the ratification debate, this carefully targeted authorization to limit the speech cast strongly against any more general national power in that area. The enumerated powers of the president and the federal courts are simply limited. No reasonable person in, 80, in 1788 would think that grants of SAD power and judicial power were freestanding authorizations to widely, widely understood rights. Nor could Congress widely rights in the course of implementing federal powers under the so-called necessary and the proper clause. As such a rights violating laws would be necessary and proper for executing those powers. As the Federalists argued to Tangium, 
the whole Bill of Rights was mostly just a big exclamation point. In that respect, the Tenth Amendment is not materially different from the rest of the Bill of Rights. It may make little formal sense to speak of Tenth Amendment doctrine, but it, it makes almost as little formal sense to speak of First Amendment doctrine or Fourth Amendment doctrine. Those other provisions make only marginal, if any, changes in the pre-1791 legal baseline. Those changes mostly involve persons in federally owned territory over whom Congress exercises much broader power than it does over residents of full states. Virtually every case involving the application of the Bill of Rights to the federal government can, and probably should, be recast as a case about the scope of the federal government's enumerated powers. The enumerated power, as a numerous cases applying various provisions of the Bill of Rights to actions state of, of state governments, where uh, the Fourteenth Amendment, uh, the whole different story that is not relevant here. Thus, if there is any value at all in speaking of First Amendment doctrine, Fourth Amendment doctrine, etc., in connection with the federal government, the same considerations make it valuable to talk about Tenth Amendment doctrine. There are two other and more concrete ways in which the Tenth Amendment has constitutional value. First, the reminder. The reminder that uh, powers not delegated to institutions of national government do not belong to institutions of national government should prevent anyone from interfere, inferring particular federal power from the general nature of governments rather than from specify, specific grants of power to the specific federal government. Nonetheless, the Supreme Court, especially in the late 19th century, uh, 19th and the early 20th century, has sometimes been very fond of arguments that are wrong, something like this. Like, all self-respecting governments can do X. Our national government is a self-respecting government, therefore our national government can do X. This kind of reasoning was used to support Duber's federal power to exercise eminent domain, to implement a military draft, to hold overseas colonies, and to pass laws concerning immigration. One actually reads the Constitution when found the enumerated congressional power over naturalization, but not the power over immigration, which therefore left the latter to the individual states, unless it can be jammed into the idea of uh, commerce with uh, foreign nations, or is somehow an uh, executive power. A straightforward reading of the Tenth Amendment forecloses that line of uh, reasoning. Second, the Tenth Amendment, along with the rest of the Bill of Rights, might have value as a kind of a backdrop, backstop in case the original constitution meaning gets too deranged. In modern times, the enumerated powers of the national government have been misread beyond all recognition, to the point that the actual constitution is not really part of the governing structure at all. We live with a shadow or zombie constitution that has the outer has, husk, sorry, the outer ha husk of uh, the original document but none of the actual substance. Once enumerative powers are misconstrued out of existence, weight falls on the rest of the Constitution, most notably the Bill of Rights, to restore to some very modest degree the original balance of power. The various Tenth Amendment cases decided by the Supreme Court may serve this function. Congress, for instance, has no enumerative power to conscript state legislatures or executives into enforcing federal law. So it does actually have enumerative power to conscript state courts into hearing federal cases through the Article 1 Tribunal's Clause. But if arguments rest on a lack of enumerative power, 
are foreclosed by rashly banned prior cases and subbing in the Tenth Amendment to reach the correct result is not a completely irrational strategy. It may be as good as getting the enumerative powers right in the first place, but it may be a plausible second best solution. Next perspective. The disappearance and unfortunate revival of the Tenth Amendment by Robert Scampero. We initially added to the United States Constitution. The Tenth Amendment stood as a reminder of the continuing importance of states and of the fundamental role of the people. The amendment was significant not for the text it supplied, but for the structure it emphasized. Emphasized. That structure has evolved over time. Recently, the United States Supreme Court has sought to revise the amendment with unfortunate results. The court has found in the amendment a license to create new barriers to the exercise of national authority, barriers that lack foundation in the text or structure of the constitutional or in sound policies of federalism. In the early part of the 20th century, the Supreme Court relied on the Tenth Amendment in resisting expanded assertions of the national power. However, during the New Deal, Congress enacted a range of federal regulatory programs, such as the Social Security, designed to stabilize the economy, protect workers, and promote the general welfare. Once the court Acquaintances in the New Deal's vision of a more active federal government, the Tenth Amendment receded from view. From the late 1930s to the mid 1970s, the Tenth Amendment essentially disappeared from U.S. constitutional law. After a brief reemergence, the Tenth Amendment went back. On the ground in 1985, before returning apparently to stay in 1992. Good reasons exist for the disappearance of the Tenth Amendment. The amendment referred to the powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, with the expanded role of the national government validated in New Deal era, the domain that then it has reserved to the states or to the people shrank dramatically. Further, during the civil rights era, when Congress, the federal courts were taking measures to end the racial discrimination, the Tenth Amendment became associated with assertions of state rights to resist claims of civil rights. The Tenth Amendment suffered from the assertion that the power reserved to the states include the power to enforce racial inequality, politically, socially, and morally. The Tenth Amendment seemed to speak to the past, not the present. Or the future. The revival of attention to the Tenth Amendment in the 1990s formed part of the Supreme Court New Federalism. In addition to renewed reliance on the Tenth Amendment, the Court also imposed greater scrutiny on Congress's power to regulate interstate commerce. Along similar lines, the Court invoked the Eleventh Amendment to limit the ability of Congress to subject state to suit in federal court. Even for claims that states were violating federal law, the court's new federalism doctrine in general and its Tenth Amendment cases in particular lack foundations in text or sound policy. In what I, in regrading the Tenth Amendment in New York versus the United States 1992, the court reaffirmed that the Tenth Amendment is a truism and essentially a tautology. The court stated that the impact of the amendment is not derived from its text. Indeed, by its terms, the Tenth Amendment applied to powers not delegated to the United States by the Constitution. The Tenth Amendment does appear to have no application to the exercise of Congress's enumerated powers. In its current incarnation, however, the function of the Tenth Amendment is to impose a non-textual limit on the use of federal power. The court has held that as even when The federal government is regulating interstate commerce. 
as authorized by Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, the federal government still may not invade certain protected enclaves for city sovereignty. The national government cannot commandeer the operation of state governments by forcing states or their political subdivisions to regularly in accordance with the federal plan or to enforce federal law. For example, in New York versus United States, the court held that the Tenth Amendment prohibited Congress from enacting a comprehensive plan for the disposal of radioactive waste that it requires states to assume responsibility for the disposal of the waste within their borders. The court raised the Tenth Amendment as functioning like the First Amendment as carrying out a part of Congress Innovative powers. That reading runs counter to the text of the Tenth Amendment. By way of policy justification, the court has said that it must draw clear lines between domains of a state and a federal authority. The blurring of a federal state functions, the court asserts, would undermine the accountability of government officials. The citizens would not know to which government entity they should address policy concerns. Scholars have questions empirical underpinnings of this line of argument. Are people really so easily confused? Moreover, given the extensive overlap of a state or federal power in so many areas, how important is it, how important is it that some areas of state exclusivity be maintained. Citizens would need a fair, sharp sense of discernment to know which would be the few areas in which the federal government was immune from responsibility. The basic problem is that the language of the Tenth Amendment appeared to assume a clear demarcation of state and federal domains of authority. This conception, sometimes terms dual federalism, no longer comports with reality. The areas of society subject to federal regulation have grown significantly over time. The power to regulate commerce with foreign nations among the several states encompasses a great realm of activity that is in prior centuries. That expansion results from the dramatic change in society and in the economy, along with the framers' choice to use the broad term of commerce accordingly, there are vast areas of overlap between state and federal authority. It's a false Iran, Iran to try to limit the overlap by carrying out the protected enclaves of exclusive state and exclusive federal regulation. The good news is that the federalism is a lie and a well in the United States today. States remain vital centers of policy debate and experimental experimentation State and federal powers intersects and overlaps in many ways that promote the well-being of the people, the interplay of state and federal decisions leading to the Supreme Court de declaring a federal constitutional right to same-sex marriage offers one recent example of federalism at work. Federal and state courts and legislatures engage in a dialogue that eventually resulted in in the recognition of national rights. However, just a fundamental, this federalism does not rely on outdated notions as to the areas of state sovereignty. This healthy federalism flourishes in spite of, not because of, the Supreme Court's effort to demarcate enclaves of state power immune from national regulation. For the moment, this exclusive state domain remain relatively small, offering little resistance to the exercise of innovative federal powers. Should the court expand this enclave, however, current Tenth Amendment doctrine will become a more significant and pernicious force.